Would you grab a Bible and and open it up with me this morning to the book of Luke? Uh, We're going to be in Luke chapter 21. Special message today, just considering the season, and so we're going to spend our time there, and yet we want you to be there with us, and so hopefully you got a Bible and you would make your way there now. Um, You can use a Bible in front of you there in the chairs. You can use an electronic device. We invite you to the Word of God. In fact, if you're in the overflow online or watching later, we just want to say the same. At the same moment, I want to be honest, it's going to take us a couple of moments to get here. We're going to spend a little bit of time building up to this passage. So here's what you can do. I mean, honestly, if you made your way there and you want to stick your bulletin uh, in that page and then lay it beside you, that would be great. But I'm hoping you found it so that when we get there, it's not going to be a hunt uh, to find your way here as we want to hear God speak to us through his word in this moment of time. So let's ask him for that. Let's go before him right now and ask that he would give us just the ability to hear what he would speak to us here today. Father, we're glad, glad for this moment, and I'm glad. I'm glad because I know you're God, and I know you're good. I think about your word that we're going to dive into this morning, and I think about how you describe it as a light that shines in a dark place. Lord, our world is dark. And yet your light, your word shines a light to us. We need it. We need to see. And I'm asking that you would help us to see. Help us to see you, your word, see what you're speaking to us now. God, I trust you. I trust you with us this morning. I trust you with this time. And I believe that you're a God who would speak to us. Though we're together, you would speak to us individually. Do that, please, Lord. Make yourself known, what you're doing known into people's hearts here. We ask for it together. And we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look up, because your redemption draws near. Hey, those words are the words of Jesus. Those words are the words we're going to speak about this morning, and we need to hear them. And one of the reasons we want to hear them is because the season that we find ourselves in, both in time, but also on the calendar. Yet this coming week begins what's known as the fall feasts of Israel. And so it's really just, you know, normal for us as a church that when we come to these, that we pause and spend a few moments uh, talking about that. If you have done this with us in times past, like you could probably fill in some of these details already. Uh, If this is brand new to you, uh, we just would like to walk you through what this means and why from the pages of Scripture and, and why it should meet us here in this space. Well, the fall feasts, what are they? Well, there are three feasts found in the Old Testament that are taking place over the next two weeks. Uh, the Feast of Trumpets starts, it happens Thursday. Uh, then next week, the Day of Atonement, and the week after, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. These three form uh, what is called the Fall Feast of Israel. Well, before we talk about those, it would probably even be more helpful if we would back up one more step and say there are seven of them. Seven feasts that God gave in the Old Testament uh, for his people. Seven uh, things that they were supposed to be on the calendar year. They would be Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. These happened every single year. These were holidays, holy days, if you want to think about it that way, that landed on the calendar. Uh, you know, I, I know that probably makes sense, but I'm just trying to make sure I catch it. You know, as much as we would have in our nation, things like Christmas or uh, Independence Day, days that we mark as a nation uh, to, to remember or celebrate, these are ones that God prescribed in the Bible, in the Old Testament for His people. Now, as we think about that, let me also be very clear. You are not bound by these. Uh, There's not a sense that we go back under the Old Testament scriptures or even find the feasts being those that we have to celebrate. Some of you will do so uh, with some joy and seeing the the pictures in it. That's great, but we're not under it. Colossians tells us really clearly that we're not to go back under the Old Testament strictures. That said, well, the point of everything in the Bible is Jesus, right? I mean, it's always all about Jesus. Jesus said, you look at the Bible, you search for it, thinking you're going to have life, but it's always about me. It's always drawing you there. So that must also be true when we think about the feasts. They picture us Christ. They give us a picture of who he is and what he's doing. And so that's what we want to do this morning, is we want to look at these as an understanding of Christ. Well, to do that, I think about it in Exodus, when God is prescribing these, he would say it this way three times. You shall keep a feast to me in the year. 
You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of harvest, and the feast of ingathering. Now, if you're really paying attention, you might be saying, but Jim, you just said there were seven. And now this says there's three. What's up? Like, how did that just happen? Well, although there are seven, there are only three seasons uh, because the feasts find themselves grouped together. The first three feasts happen in a matter of one week. Uh, The last three happen in a matter of two weeks. And so for their celebrations, uh, for a Jew who would be making his way to Jerusalem, he would make his way to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, three different seasons. uh, And he would stay there for those three things. And so really there were three moments in time through the year where these were to be highlighted. Now, if that's tracking, what's really powerful is to think through how God describes them, just hearing the words. He says the first season is unleavened bread, the second is harvest, and the third is in gathering. Unleavened bread, harvest, in gathering. Well, let's go back over to our list of the seven. And again, they really fall into three categories. If you were to look at it in 2024 this year, uh, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits happened in just a few days. That was March 28th, 30th, 31st. Uh, then we had Pentecost happen in May. And then now again, we're gazing forward to the last three that happened over the next two weeks uh, from October 3rd to October 17th. But we already know. I mean, Jesus has told, I mean, it tells us there in Exodus that these are pictures of Christ. And so we'd look at these first three feasts and they become the feast of unleavened bread. That's when Jesus dies on the cross pays the price for our sin, and rises again on Resurrection Day, on Easter Sunday. That really is a season that declared His first coming, that what Jesus came and did there, it is that. Now again, just I like the word, helps me, maybe it helps you, unleavened bread. Leaven's a picture of sin. Always in the Bible, when uh, leaven is used as kind of a type or a picture, it's always about sin. And so those first three feasts, sin is undone. Sin is unleavened. I mean, Christ paid the price for our sin. He paid the whole price for our sin. That our sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and we bear it no more. I mean, we celebrate what he has already accomplished, past tense, and that's a good celebration. Then you fast forward, uh, you know, into, into Pentecost, and we did this there in May, and it becomes the Feast of Harvest. It becomes one where that is, and it describes a season that in the, in the time period of history becomes a harvest of souls, that God is rescuing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, that it becomes a, a season where that's happening, where if we're thinking about it on a prophetic calendar, it's the season you're in. I mean, we're still here. The reason we got to gather here on this Sunday morning is because Jesus is still saving. I mean, there's still people that are being saved. We're still in the midst of of the harvest, but it began there. By the way, just interesting enough, all of those feasts began on those actual days. Jesus literally, you know, dies on the cross at Passover, rises at the Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost there in Acts 2, launches out the beginning of, of the church. I mean, incredible things happening, but all those are kind of past and then present, but then we move forward to those things which are future And we think through these last three feasts, uh, that picture of the rapture, the second coming heaven that we'll talk about a little bit this morning, and they become the feast of in-gathering. Again, it's like it. It's not that hard. Probably most of you are already there. Uh, It's in-gathering, or we would maybe separate it in our modern vernacular, and we'd say in-gathering, or flip it around and say gathering in. We're celebrating when Jesus is going to gather us into heaven when he's going to fulfill what he promised, where he says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. You know, I'm going to come again, and I'm going to receive you to myself, that where I am, you can be also. I'm going to gather you out of this world. I'm going to gather you to myself. And that's what the final feast picture that we're waiting for Christ to accomplish, that we're looking ahead uh, to those things that are in front of us, by God's promises, prophetically, that he would fulfill those. And so that's what makes it part of the reason why we look at this this morning, why we think about these things, why we look at it, because again, it falls on this calendar where we are, that we want to think about these things that are happening over the next two weeks on the calendar and hopefully just be met in them. Well, let me quickly walk you through these. Um, and then when we get done with that, we'll, we'll launch into our passage here in Luke 21 and hear what Jesus has to say. But quick understanding. So the Feast of Trumpets, 
Uh, that's going to happen uh, this coming Thursday. If you're reading with us in the Bible, you have it on your Bible reading bookmark. Uh, we pause our daily reading on those days and invite you to read special verses. And so you would notice on the bookmark that we gave you this morning, on Thursday you're going to be reading that, uh, thinking about these things. And that really fit pictures this season that's coming. Literally, in the Hebrew, Rosh Hashanah is what this means. And it really is a foreshadowing, I believe, of the rapture. Uh, the Bible talks about a place where Jesus is going to come and bring us to himself. Now, I think about that, and it makes itself really significant and interesting uh, without going too much into it, unless you want to go further on your own. The Feast of Trumpets is a fascinating feast biblically. Uh, we don't know much about it, even in the Old Testament. It never really describes why it's there. There's lots of things historically that Jews uh, connected to it, but not biblically. It's kind of this mysterious feast, which kind of figures in really well into the rapture that it is this picture of something that was almost un not understood before, but now finds itself understood. Paul would declare it in 1 Thessalonians, This I say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So this is really quick, so just think about it. He describes two categories of people. Some that he says are asleep in the Lord. That's a biblical designation for believers who've died. He says, so there's going to be these people that, uh, you know, they've, they've died and, and they're with, you know, they're waiting for this to happen. But there's going to be another generation that's going to be alive in that moment when Jesus returns. Uh, that when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a generation who, who will remain until that happens. He says, and then when that happens, when the Lord himself and from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, at the trumpet of God, feast of trumpets, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So everybody who's, you know, a follower of Jesus and has died, they're going to rise. They're going to get their brand new bodies that they've been waiting for, and they're going to rise with Jesus. And then those who remain will be with them in the clouds and the air. will always be with the Lord. Wow. Hey, this is an incredible reality. He's telling us there's going to be a group of people that are alive into that last moment, and when that happens, the dead are going to rise, they're going to be in the clouds, and those who are believe leave this planet, and they're to be caught up. Caught up is interesting. And in the Latin trend, which is where we get the word, I, I toss every now and then, some, oh, you believe in the rest in the Bible. It's like, just depends on, you know, if you want to have a Latin translation, it would. But you know what? I'm fine. If you don't want to use the term rapture, you could use caught away. That's what it's using. It's this, this catching away. It's this place where he is going to rescue and bring his people home. And he tells us that's upcoming. That there's going to be this space that he tells us that those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That is believers who've died before us. And we're going to meet in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then from that moment, man, we'll always be with the Lord. I mean, with expectation, he invites us to that. And so as we're gazing at this week, there is a sense that that expectation uh, is meant to be just fresh, uh, that part of what our intention is this morning is to do that. Now, here's what I know. Um, some of you, you, you are absolutely on board with this. Like, you're here this morning, you're like, yeah, Jim, I'm so excited, and uh, you, you, you understand this. Um, but also, here's what I probably also understand. There might be some of you who are like, oh, Jim, I don't know if I believe in that. Um, uh, you know, I, I've come from a different background, or I've had different understandings, and I'm not sure uh, where I land on that. Let me be really clear about this. The belief in the rapture of Jesus Christ is not something that determines whether you are saved or not. I mean, you could disagree with us, and it's fine. You can be wrong and still be saved. I, I'm just kidding, obviously. Um, but you really, I mean, in one sense, it really is not one of those things that define the difference between a believer or unbeliever. I mean, there's a lot of Christians who don't believe in this, and I want to say, hey, I understand. I understand where some of that comes from, and it's most important that you believe in Christ, and you're going to be fine. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be fine, but I think there is a sense of believing in it, and we certainly do. So I thought I would take a couple of quick moments and just address why. Just giving you a few. There's actually dozens of reasons uh, why we would believe this, but we do. I mean, we do as, as, as a church, in fact, as a movement, uh, really across Calvary chapels, Calvary chapels all across our land. It's one of our defining things that uh, would say, hey, we believe in this. We believe in the return of Christ. We believe in his rapture. So it shouldn't be that you'd ever find a Calvary chapel that's not holding to this, because again, it is making up who we are, but there's still solid reasons to believe it. I think about it this way, reasons to believe it, first of all, because it really does embrace the imminent return of Christ. Really, as far as a belief in the end times and how that works, it is really those who believe this have this expectation 
that Jesus could come back at any moment. If you are someone who believes in what's called a mid-tribulation rapture or a post-tribulation rapture, you're not looking for Jesus. I mean, you're looking for the Antichrist. He's got to rise first. And then you'd actually even know when Jesus is coming back because the book of Revelation gives us by the day. It tells us exactly how many days it would be. There's not any sense of not knowing when Jesus would return. But the Bible holds out to us this expectation that it's not known. Jesus says, of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, my Father only. Like nobody knows when it's going to happen. But he says, therefore, you also be ready. Like always be ready. Always be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. Like it's going to catch it. It's going to grab our world. It's not going to be something that, that is, is, is seen coming. It's just going to happen immediately like a thief in the night. He tells us that kind of reality that it would be there. And that belief really goes hand in hand with this because we have this expectation before any of the other things that the Bible tells us is going to happen at the end. This will happen first, that Jesus is going to come. Not only is it one of those senses, thinking of that, that really ties us into this imminent return of Christ, the second reason is that the church is not appointed to wrath. So let me see if I can make this clear as, as mud. <laughs> I'll just try. Um, wrath. When the Bible talks about wrath, it is his direct hand judgment, something that comes from him. Now, there's lots of spaces in the world where God disciplines his people. There's lots of spaces in Christianity and spaces in history and spaces in Israel where God would discipline his people. And most of the time when that happens, it's a sense that he just lets them fall into the hand of men, uh, that he takes his hand of blessing off of them, or, or he allows them to lose a war. He allows something to happen that's natural, uh, that is, you know, wars or something, and, and they lose, or they're conquered by the Babylonians. There's things that happen, but that's not really wrath. That is God's discipline. That's his hand taken off. But wrath is when God himself is inflicting that on mankind. And it tells us when we think about that in that passage that we were reading there in Thessalonians, he says, but God did not appoint us to that. He did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Like that's not where we are. When we think about what's coming, uh, Jesus would say it this way. He says, for then there will be such great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Jesus describing the wrath of God that's going to pour out on the earth during what we call the great tribulation. He says, it's worse than anything that's ever happened. Worse than anything that's ever happened in the history of the world. It's going to be the, the single most defining moment that defines that. But again, it's not a place just of him giving it over to mankind. He himself will inflict that judgment. But when he does that, he always takes his people out first. Probably one of the best places to see that biblically is in the Old Testament. Many of you guys know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's a story of God's wrath. It's his wrath pouring out on Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not just being given over to an, an army. It's fire falling from heaven and wiping out wiping out an entire valley. But before he does that, he has to take Lot out, who is incredibly carnal. But the New Testament tells us in Peter that he had a godly soul, like he was a believer, like he actually is his. And so God has to remove him before the judgment can fall. In fact, he tells Lot, the angel speaking to him, he says, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Like the angel who is about to bring fire and judgment on, on the land says, I can't do it till you're gone. I, I, can't, I, I can't bring the fire of God that's going to destroy everything and everyone here until you're out. And I just want to tell you, that's the heart of God. I mean, that's where we are. And so we would look on that and say, part of this embracing of the rapture is understanding that God is about to deal in massive judgment on our world. The wrath of God is going to be poured out, and that's not for us. That is not for us. We, like Lot, will be taken out before that happens. So that's another reason to believe this. But maybe even more simply, the idea of believing in the rapture of Jesus Christ is one that would simply take the Bible literally. Believing that God said what he meant and meant what he said, even when you can't put all the pieces together. When you take it literally, like, I, I mean, he says we're going to meet him in the clouds. So I think we're going to meet him in the clouds. I mean, I just, I mean, I, I think he meant that. I mean, when he gave promises, he meant all of the promises, whether they were to us or to Israel. Think about it this way. John Walvoord, who is a Dallas theological uh, professor there, said, taking scripture in its plane 
ordinary meaning and explaining it in these sense leads to one to be premillennial and pre-tribulational. Hey, those are big words. Just understand that's belief in the rapture. That's belief that God is going to rescue us first before those things happen. He says, when you just believe the Bible, when you just say, you know, I, 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 I just, it means it. I don't, I don't understand every piece of it, but I know everything that he says. He means exactly what he says. He says, on the other hand, uh, by contrast, those who approach the Bible creedily uh, tend to make the scriptures conform to their accepted creeds and tend to be amillennial. He says, there is this belief that those who begin to look at the Bible and history and, and understanding through kind of a man-made definition, uh, and then those begin to force it on Scripture. He says, for the most part, those who do that will end up in this belief that don't believe this, but it's really because they're approaching it in a way that begins to explain the way just God said it, and he's going to do it. You know, he's, he's going to do that, but if you take the Bible literally, I think you'll come to this conclusion. I think we're looking at something like this. Well, one more, just for time's sake. Um, the pre-tribulational, to believe in the rapture, it's the only uh, belief system that really understand, just embraces that there's a difference between Israel and the church, that, that God's work in Israel uh, is different. We haven't replaced Israel. Uh, we don't take Israel's place. Uh, we, you know, God's going to do a work in Israel again. In fact, he has promises that he gave them that he has not yet fulfilled to them, uh, that he's going to fulfill to them because everything he said he's going to do. And, and so there's an understanding of seeing that is different and understanding God's way is different. It's the only one that does that. And so if you see that, understand that Israel has a unique place both in prophecy and in history and in the future. Well, I think, again, you would, the only way to come to it is to eventually come here. Well, I give you that for your good help. And again, I recognize for some of you, you're there. For some of you, you're not. And again, I love you. You are welcome here. We're not trying to chase you out. We just want to be really clear where we are and just give you good reasons why you might say, okay, maybe I ought to think this thing through. Uh, there's good reasons uh, to believe what we believe. And we believe they're biblical. We believe they're right. And we would certainly invite you into that. And we gaze at coming up on this Thursday. Well, there's a sense that we just think, hey, that pictures that which is to come. Now, before I go past this, I probably ought to say this. Is, G could, is Jesus going to come back on the Feast of Trumpets? Is it, is it going to happen Thursday? I don't know. Uh, but here's what I want you to understand. It could happen at any day. There's a lot of really cool things, and I won't even walk you into all the different reasons and how, but my understanding of this causes me to believe that the rapture could happen any day of the year, at any space, and so every day I'm ready. Like I, I, Sometimes in my prayer time, I'm usually like, okay, Lord, today would be a good day. Like I'm, I'm in if you're in. Let's go. Uh, you know, uh, and I believe that. That said, that this idea of coming at it this Thursday still just refreshes that hope in my life of an understanding that we live in a time that on the prophetic calendar, this is the next thing that's coming. This is the next thing that's going to draw us into that moment. And so there ought to be a fresh expectation of that. Well, we leave that. And so if you're going to continue reading with us the following Friday, you're going to be reading about the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, which is literally in Hebrew, the Day of Atonement. Uh, this is a day that foreshadows Jesus' second coming, his return literally to planet Earth that takes place at the end of what's known as a tribulation. So a seven-year tribulation is prophesied in Scripture. At the end of it, Jesus is going to rule and reign. He's not coming to meet us in the clouds. At this moment, he's coming down to planet Earth, and he's going to land, and he's going to begin ruling and reigning. He's going to reign for a thousand years, uh, bringing in all the promises he gave to Israel, and then taking us into the future. It's this moment where he's going to be the one that comes and begins to right the wrongs of the world, and he rules literally on planet Earth, which is going to be glorious. By the way, that's a little bit of hope for you. In fact, I'll think about it this way with you. So if you understand the calendar year for the Jews, the Day of Atonement was singularly significant in the sense that on that day, it was the only day that the high priest was able to go into the Holy of Holies, that only one man and only in that space, and it highlighted this kind of unique space of saying, hey, he's the only one. Uh, foreshadowing what Jesus is going to do, like he's the only one that can bring this about. Now, I think about that because I think about where we are. You guys know, right? I mean, we are in an election cycle, just a number of weeks away from our presidential election here. And I want to say this carefully. I think you should vote well. I think you should vote according to your belief and conscience and Bible. But here's what I want you to understand. No matter who wins that day, if we're still here, um, they're not going to fix the world. Like, they're not the savior of the world. Like, they, they just can't do it. There's only one. 
There's only one person who can fix the brokenness in our world. And there's only one person that can fix the brokenness in your life. And that's Jesus. I mean, he is coming back. And, and our expectation is this moment when he does what nobody else could ever do. And so that day of Yom Kippur is this expectation of, God, I'm longing for you. I'm longing for this day where Jesus, you rule and reign on planet Earth. Well, if you have your Bible bookmark, you can flip it over. And on the other side, on the 17th, that's going to be the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot in the Hebrew. And this third feast of the uh, fall feast, it really pictures heaven. It is this picture of an expectation of when you and I are in heaven and we look back in a rear view mirror at, at everything that was and all the things of this world. It's, going to be, it's a great, it's one of my favorite of, of, of the feast, worthy of your understanding and celebration, but also just the expectation of, of all of that coming. So these things are laid out to us. I mean, we think about what's coming. We think about where these are. We think about these three feasts. And because they're coming over the next two weeks, again, that's why we're here and why we take a moment to remind you. But now I want you to hear Jesus. So I hope you got your Bible. And if you do, you had it open, you marked it, opened it up to Luke chapter 21. And we're going to quickly read through a lot of this chapter, not all of it for time's sake, but it's where Jesus is answering. And he's explaining some of the things that you and I are talking about but even how we should respond to it. So thinking about where we are and what's taking place, we just want to do that. So join me there. In Luke 21, uh, it says, They, the disciples, asked him, saying, verse 7, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign will be when these things are about to take place? They're asking, Jesus, when is all this going to happen? And, and how will we know? And the first thing that Jesus tells them is a warning not to be uh, deceived, not to let anybody t you know, lead them astray. He said to them, take heed that you are not deceived. Because many are going to come in my name saying, I am he. Oh, the time is drawn near. He says, there are going to be some people that say, hey, I'm actually the Messiah. I came back. Others are going to say, I know it's when. I know exactly when it is, and, and you need to like, quit your job and be ready. For, I, mean, what, I mean, weird things that have happened in history. Says, when, when someone comes and says that kind of thing, he says, therefore, don't go after them. Like, you should know, mm, no, like, you, no, you're not Jesus, and you don't know when it is. Um, when, he, when, they, when you hear wars and commotions, verse 9, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. So he warns. He says, there's a lot of things that are going to happen in these, in these intervening years. There's going to be wars. There's going to be pestilences. There's going to be earthquakes, hurricanes. I mean, yeah, I mean, just, yeah, there's going to be stuff all over and it's going to feel devastating. But he says, I don't want you to be shaken. Like, that's not the end. Uh, nobody knows. Uh, don't let that happen. And maybe my first just kind of quick thing is saying, don't let it happen to you. In the history of our, of our world, probably some of the biggest deceptions that have happened in Jesus' name have been these, where people have either said that they are Jesus or they, they know when Jesus is coming back or he did come back and cults that surrender on that. And you should just be able to go, I recognize that for a lie. Like, that's not true. That's not the way this works, and that's not my Savior. And so he's warning you not to let these things find you uh, in a way that's been deceived. Scan down uh, there in, in verse 19, and notice what Jesus says. He says, by your patience, possess your souls. So he warns about all these things. He warns about persecution before this in the verses that we just kind of jumped over. The way things are going to happen through the years, he says, here's what I want you to do. If you want to hold on to your soul, you want to handle this well, be patient. Uh, be patient. And, and it's just a good word to us, by the way. In fact, the Bible would often use the phrase uh, throughout the New Testament that as we think about Jesus coming back, we are eagerly waiting. And I love those two words together. Like we're eager, like I'm so excited. Like I want him to come back. And then we were like, but you know what? I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I'm, I'm patient. Um, and I want you to know that's how we're supposed to be. We should be like, I, I hope it's this week. I hope he really comes. But we should also be like, but Jesus, if you want to wait a year or you want to wait a hundred years, I'm fine. I mean, I'm fine. Because I know this, every day you wait, you're waiting for people to be saved. And so I can be patient. I, 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 I want to possess my soul. I want to possess my heart by saying, Jesus, I'm fine. I'm fine waiting until the right moment. And so he invites us to that, to have this eager anticipation, but this patience. 
But then we jump down uh, into verse 28, and he says it this way. He says, now, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So we jumped over a section that would just take us too long to unpack. He gives a section of prophecy that some of it's dual fulfillment. A little bit complicated, but always that way in the Bible. Some of it happened in 70 AD, that God speaks judgment on Israel, but some of it's yet to happen. In fact, he pictures all of that, and he begins to describe it in verses 25 and 26 and 27. And, he, and in those verses, he's talking about the Great Tribulation, uh, the end of the world, where he says there's going to be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and perplexity, and men's hearts are going to fail them. It's going to be this horrible season of mankind. But now looking back over, he says, when you see that begin, when you see these things begin to happen, when you see these things begin to come to place, he says, you ought to be the one who's like looking around. Like, okay, Jesus is it now. Like, I'm ready. Like, you ought to look up because your redemption is drawing near. So we are meant to have this expectation that is looking for Jesus to come back. And he tells us if you see things that seem like they're the beginning of that. Like, it, like you're watching things and you're thinking, okay, could this be? It should prompt you to, to be looking for Jesus' return. So let's take just a couple of moments and maybe try to ask that question of us today. What is there today that's happening in our world that would give us a sense of expectation that maybe, maybe we're really close to this? Well, there's a lot of answers to this, so this is just a few. Uh, but first, understand we actually don't need anything to happen. Uh, the, the second coming of Christ, again, remember the rapture of the church specifically, is one that could happen at any moment. So we're not waiting for anything to happen. It could happen right now, as well as it could happen next week or the week. I mean, there is nothing waiting. So we have that understanding. We don't need anything to happen first. That said, there are things that are going to be happening either then or after the rapture that he says, if you see it beginning to be fulfilled, you should be just drawing to it. So what would that be? Well, first, and foremost, it's Israel. In fact, I want you to see it. Go back and look at it in the verse with me. So you're reading in verse 28 again, right? So notice it. It says, now, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them a parable saying, look at the fig tree and all the trees. He says, I'm going to tell you a parable. I'm going to tell you a parable about a fig tree, which we'll read in a moment, and all the trees... But prophetically, I mean, kind of a prophetic picture, Israel is the fig tree. I mean, when you, when you look at a fig tree in the Bible, it's Israel. And he says, I want you to look and see Israel and all the other trees, like all the other nations, like everything else is happening. So it's not just Israel, but it's Israel. When we think about that, here's what I want you to just to think through with me. Israel is back in the land. I mean, Israel's back in the land, and I cannot just even begin to unpack for you how absolutely huge that is. I mean, it's the problem is it's, they've been back in the land now for 76 years. And so for most of us, that's been your whole life. I mean, you, you've never known anything different than this. But for over 1,900 years, they were out. Uh, they, they'd been kicked out of the land. They'd been removed. And... The even thought of them coming back was at times so foreign. You know, I think about it. You know, I believe in the rapture of the church, and we were talking about it a moment ago. Sometimes I, I look at people today who don't believe in the rapture, um, and I could have understood that 100 years ago. You know, 100 years ago when Israel didn't exist, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, I can kind of understand people being like, well, you know... I don't know if it actually literally means Israel's going to come back into the land, and, and people didn't. And it's some of what gave birth to what we know as a replacement theology, uh, that people thought the church replaced Israel. But Israel exists. I mean, and they are a, mar a miracle beyond anything that could be imagined. I mean, it's never happened in the history of the world that any nation who has been kicked out of their nation uh, for, for three generations has ever reassembled or ever come back. They've all lost their identities, all of them. Assyrians, I mean, whatever nation there was, they're gone. I mean, they're gone. It's never happened in the history of the world, but it has happened. Israel's back in the land where they were. They're speaking their language. Prophetically, it is shockingly. I mean, it's amazing that they're there. And to see that happen and know it is to see prophecy unfolding. I think about it. Um, that Israel exists is a miracle. It's a miracle because it could, just shouldn't have been able to happen. 
Uh, the, you know, they have survived for 76 years, and it's been a miracle that they've done so. They've been outnumbered. They've been outgunned. They, 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 they've been backed into a corner so many times, and Israel has continued uh, to exist and thrive. Some of it is because of their ingeniousness, yes. I mean, like pagers. Whoever thought of pagers? I mean, hey, uh, I mean, some of it's like really, really like crazy school stuff that we'd look back on and say, that's amazing. But you have to see bigger than this that it has to be gone. That the only reason that they could have existed in the midst of this world is because God himself has put his hand around that and, and they've continued to be there. And so Israel being in the land, it has us going, okay, well, I wonder if we're close. I mean, I can't help but feel like we're in overtime. You know, it's been like 76 years. Like, they've been in the land 76 years. I mean, we're in overtime. I mean, they're already back. You know, let's, I mean, it is an amazing place, but it's prophetically huge. As you're thinking about that, understand this. Not only is that they're back in the land, but the Bible tells us that in the last days, they are going to be completely isolated. In Zechariah, he would describe it this way. He says, it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. And all who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. He says, there's going to be a day coming when the whole world is going to be turned against Israel. Do you feel it? I mean, do you feel that's where we are? The rise in anti-Semitic uh, thoughts and uh, persecutions has you know, exponentially grown, even in the last year. I mean, it's become this incredible thing that nations are turning and voting and uh, whole nations and spaces turning all against Israel. And there needs to be a space that you're looking at this and going, wow. I mean, this, we, we, it feels they're there. It's not entirely there. I mean, we think about it. Um, where we as a nation uh, are still one of Israel's allies. Um, but biblically, that's going to go away. Um, I don't know how it's going to go away. I mean, some of us are watching this next election are a little bit worried about it, uh, you know, thinking, okay, where are, are we going to turn as a nation? Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. Maybe there's still enough people who are believers that hold our nation back. But here's where I am. You know, I, I look on all of these things, and uh, I am one of those ones who believe that some of these things that are given to us prophetically are going to happen after the rapture. And so here's the deal. If the rapture happened today, how do I say this nicely? I hope it cripples our nation. I, I hope there's so many believers in our nation and in places of influence that when it happens, our nation falls apart uh, because a lack of believers being there. And in that space, Israel will be all alone. Israel will be entirely alone. But it's happening now. It's beginning to happen. There ought to be something inside of you that feels the, the weight of the anti-Semitic just influence happening and being going, wow, I think. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this, is, this looks like the world. The whole world is turning against Israel. In fact, let me just toss this out. Um, I don't know how you understand this and you know, where your background is, but sometimes if you watch the news, you would really think that Israel was a big deal. Uh, like somehow geographically or, you know, they're, they're not. It's a tiny little nation. You could fit Israel into the state of Texas 42 times. 42 times. I mean, it's a tiny little nation. It's the size of New Jersey. I mean, it's tiny. It is not a big space. You would kind of think, wow, this is, you know, Israel's a big deal. No, it's so small. It's radically weird that it's in the news every day. It's prophetic. It's only beginning to happen. Maybe you would even look at it. You know, sometimes the news tries to portray, you know, Israel as they're the big bad bully and the Arab nations, you know, poor Arab nations. But the Arab nations are 450 times bigger than Israel. I mean, Israel's like this little bitty nation and 450 times bigger are these the Arab nations that hate them. And you look on this and think, wow, this is really weird that Israel still exists uh, and that the, the whole world would be focused on such a small piece of real estate. It's, it's prophetic. You live in days, and yet somehow I think sometimes we miss how significant that is. Well, we're talking about Israel. Let me keep going. So not only are we thinking about Israel back in the land, but there is a war coming, a war described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that has never happened in the history of mankind. So believing that God said what he said, meant what he said, there's a war that has not yet happened that needs to happen. It's a war where he says he's going to bring nations, uh, Rosh, Magog, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, and Gomorrah. These six nations are going to come together and, and attack Israel. And it's never happened. Uh, it's never happened, and so we know it's going to happen. 
Now, those who believe that God says what he says, and it's going to happen, we don't all agree as to when this is going to happen. So good Bible students see it differently. I'm just going to tell you where I believe it because I'm the one who's talking right now. And, uh, you know, but at the same point, just say, if you disagree, that's fine. I tend to believe that this is going to happen after the rapture, uh, before the great tribulation. I tend to believe that you and I are never going to see it. Uh, I, think it's going to, I think it's going to be part of the outflow of the world, that when we're gone, uh, the world's going to enter in an upheaval. I think at that moment, there's going to be, you know, a, a gamut for power. At that moment, these nations are going to gather together to come against Israel. God is going to stand up and defend them, and it's going to begin his defense against them, but the world's going to begin shifting, and it will ultimately lead to the rise of the Antichrist, bunches of stuff in there. But what's fascinating about this is, even though we're not going to see it, I think, what's fascinating is to begin to see how it's already beginning to come together. So, Rosh, Magog, that's Russia. I mean, ultimately Russia and, and, and the nations around Russia. Uh, Persia, that's modern-day Iran. Uh, Togarma there, that's Turkey. And you have Gomer up there, uh, Libya, Ethiopia. They're all coming together in some unique ways. But here's the really interesting thing. In the history of the world, it's never really happened. Um, so like Russia and Iran, they have never been good friends. Uh, there's never been a place that they have gone to war together. There's never been a place they've had alliances. They do now. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching, but in this day when they're in their battle with Ukraine, uh, Iran has become closer and closer uh, with Russia, and they begin supplying ballistic missiles and things and in, in, in their drones to Russia, and they're beginning to become really, really tight partners. Turkey was a really interesting. For a little while, it seemed like they were going democratic and was going to go differently. They went entirely the other way. So that in the midst of this last year war, they have chanted over and over, death to Israel, and we're against them. And these three nations have actually begun closer and closer. In fact, Friday... Uh, Friday in the United Nations, uh, the, the d department heads or the representatives of Russia, Turkey, and Iran were meeting together in closed doors. And it's just one of those things like, well, that's funny. Like, that's just a funny thing. Like, that's never happened before, and it is happening now. I mean, we're watching things begin to happen. So again, it doesn't have to happen this way. I mean, maybe it'll happen this week, or maybe it'll be a year, or maybe it'll be a hundred years. And I'm fine if it's a hundred years. I really, really am. But there's enough things happening now that make us just go, well, that's interesting. Like, that, that, like, that's just interesting. I mean, we just watch it. In fact, for some of us, we're watching the war in Lebanon right now uh, with Israel. And it's, it, you know, if Jesus doesn't come back, this last two weeks are going to be one of these military things that are going to be studied for years. It has been one of the most effective uh, campaigns in the history of mankind that has decapitated a nation. I mean, pagers. You know, it's like just crazy. On top of that, they're targeted things. I mean, they've literally undone and, and so in some ways, some are people looking at this, and there are a number of things that even in this seem to trigger towards a Ezekiel War. Could happen. Again, God might be gracious and give us time back, but all of this just makes it feel like the world that we're living is biblically significant and, and it biblically historically significant that should move us that way. Well, let me give you one more, and then we'll go back uh, to what Jesus is saying. Things that make me right now say, well, that's interesting. Of course, there's Israel. Everything is happening there. But the other thing that really moves me right now is the growing wickedness uh, that's happening in our world that reminds us of what Jesus told us about the days of Noah. So when Jesus was explaining it, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days uh, of the Son of Man. Just like it was back then before the global flood, uh, the way the world was, there's going to be some things that mark what this world is like. Well, what is that? Well, we go back to Genesis. And in Genesis 5, it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. God looked, and the world had become so corrupt. It had become so wicked. Uh, it, it, it just wickedness had so permeated every aspect of society that it just seemed to just darken every thought. And so God says to them, he says, I'm going to destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air. And he does it with a flood. He does it with a worldwide flood that destroys all of that. Peter tells us he did it with a flood then. He's, next time he's going to do it with fire. He's going to destroy the world by fire. And, and yet it finds itself in the same space. I, I think you probably are aware of this. I don't think I have to spend much time on this. But our world is growing more and more wicked by the day. Uh, it, it, it's surprising. It's surprising sometimes how quick it's happening. You know, I found a, listening to a couple of people over the last few days, and they talked about the whole idea. You know, you've heard that idea of a frog that you put in the water, you know, and if you put a frog in boiling water, it'll jump out. But if you put a frog in water and you slowly turn up the heat, uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll actually boil to death. I mean, kind of just one of those crazy, weird science things, whatever. But um, 
That's how our world is gone. I mean, we, but it, sometimes it seems like we're turning up the heat so fast. I mean, wickedness has grown. Uh, so that, you know, when I think about what's being pumped into children, uh, when I think about the, 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 the flow happening uh, and through, through all the access, I mean, it, it feels, if you didn't even know that Jesus was coming back soon, uh, you might think, I think our world's about to fall apart. I mean, I think we're about to tear ourselves apart. I mean, there, there, there's so much fractioning. There's so much darkness and there's so much wickedness and it's everywhere. I think it's close. I think just all by itself, we feel that. And so he tells us those kinds of things, like things that we tell us, hey, these are going to be the things that are happening. He tells us when you see that, going back to there in, in, in Luke 21, he says, when you see these things begin, like you just see the, the very beginning things of what I've told you are going to happen, you should be looking up. You should lift up your heads uh, because your redemption draws near. I mean, you should. I mean, you should be like one of those people like, okay, I'm, I'm looking up. I mean, so here's here, here, just, just a little practical. I mean, like you could do this. Like Thursday, if you wanted to, you could wake up, get out of your bed, stand beside your bed, and just look there and then just do a little jump. You know, just, and just give some rapture practice. You know I mean? It's like one of those things like, like hey, you know, like, Lord, if, you, if you're interested, like, we, I'll jump up and we could just keep going. Like, you know, I just thought, you know, just in case, just in case you want me to give you, I mean, I'm, I'm in. You know, I mean, but what, I mean, there ought to be that kind of thing. Like, Lord, I think we're so close. I, and, and I want to look with an expectation that would say, I believe, I believe it could be. And I want to live in that kind of light. And to that, Jesus tells us a couple other things. We'll read it quickly and just note it. So go back. You see it there in verse 28. It says, you should be looking up. You should be watching for it. Then he says in verse 29, he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees when they are already budding. And, and, and you see it, you should see the beginning of the buds, then you know that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. There's a lot of interesting prophetic thoughts in that, and different people go in different ways, but we could just be really simple. When it happens, it's going to happen fast. Um, this isn't something that's going to start and last for 200 years. Uh, when it starts, uh, when, when, when these things begin to happen, uh, it's going to happen very, very quickly. It's going to happen very, very, you know, seven-year tribulation. I mean, gonna, it's going to happen super fast. And he says, so you, you ought to have that understanding. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen quickly, but it's going to happen certainly. Verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. His words entirely, but certainly his words speaking to us about this. He says, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. What I've said to you, Jesus says, this is going to happen. And, and you should be one that believes it. You should be one that's like, okay, you know, what Jesus said is going to happen. But then he gives us the response. He says, you take heed to yourselves. Verse 34, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come uh, as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. I mean, the whole world is going to be just rocked by this. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I mean, this becomes this really practical level. Um, If we believe it, if we really believe that this could happen, it will be producing in us more holiness, more readiness for Jesus to come back. He says, there ought to be a sense, if you believe this and you're wasting your life right now, like you're, you know, drunkenness and crowsing and cares of this life, yeah, like, yeah, stop. You know, you I mean, like there ought to be a sense that if, if that's where you are right now, and here's where you kind of get very, very practical. I mean, so what if it is this week? Are you ready? I mean, if Jesus comes back this week, are you ready? Uh, or is there something right now that you're like, huh, there's a couple things I wanted to fix first. There's a couple things I really would rather not be found that way. Well, then you ought to fix them. Uh, like it ought to be motivating uh, that everyone, it tells us in 1 John, that has this hope in him purifies himself. Like we really believe Jesus is coming back. We're going to be in the space of, of saying, God, I want to be made ready. And if that's where you are, that's a good motivation today to say, you ought to be ready. Like this should motivate you towards holiness. Now, if he's gracious and, and he gives time, that shouldn't make you like, okay, I can go back to sinning. No, because you you don't know he can come at any moment and more. It's like, man, it just has helped me to get there. And if he's gracious, he's gracious. But I certainly want to be one 
who is ready for Jesus to come back. And the only way you're ready for Jesus to come back is if you're living well, if you're walking with him and walking in his ways. That's the only way you're ready. And so we invite you to that. But you know what? Maybe you're here this morning and you're not ready because you're not a Christian. Uh, you're not here. You're here this morning. And you don't know him. In fact, I love the way Jesus gave us in those words. Go back and see it with me there as he's speaking it. He says there in verse 36, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. He says, if you see this, then you ought to be praying that you could be counted worthy. Can I just give you one of those simple Bible questions? How in the world could you be counted worthy? The only way we can be counted worthy is in Christ. Uh, the only way that we are made worthy of eternity is believing in Jesus, having a life in him. I mean, it's the, I mean we're, we, in our own life, in our own self, we are not worthy. But in Christ, we are made righteous. We are made holy. We are made worthy. Jesus paid the price for our sins. And so he's telling you, if you're here this morning and you're not ready, you should pray. You should ask God to save you. You should pray that you could be made worthy. You should pray that you could be forgiven, that you could stand to pass when Jesus comes. And so we just give it to you as an exhortation right now. Hey, it's a good way. It's the reason we're still here. I mean, biblically, the only reason that's holding us back from this happening is God is still saving people. And maybe you're the one. Maybe it's you this morning that God is giving time to to repent. And we just want to tell you it's a good day to repent. It's a good day to be ready because it feels like it could happen really, really, really quickly. Well, you can close your Bibles, your notebooks. With that in mind, let's just take a moment, and I want to give you an opportunity just to pray for this. And so, again, just in very practical ways, I just want to speak to you. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. We love you. God loves you, and you're not ready. You need to know Jesus. You can. Uh, and so we're going to ask you to pray. We're going to give you a quiet moment to pray, and we're going to ask you to pray for it. To pray that you would be counted worthy that God would meet you in that space that if you're broken, if you need to give your life to him, that you could be forgiven right now uh, and, and be worthy in Christ, be made in the righteousness of Christ, to be right in him. And, and we tell you that's laid out before you. And it would be a, a good day to do that. So you can pray quietly. And then after church, uh, we'll have people up here at the front of the church and come up and talk to them. Talk to them about the, you know, just wanting to give your life to Jesus. They'll walk you through it and help you just navigate what that looks like. But we just invite you to Christ. Then I just again speak to some of you. And the simple deal is you're not ready. You might know Jesus, but you're not ready. Like you, you, you're, 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 you're spinning your tires. You're, you're, you're caught up in the cares of the world. You're living in drunkenness and you're, you're living a life that's not ready for Jesus to come back. He says, if you see it, then, then fix that. Like you should be like, okay, like Jesus is coming back. What in the world am I doing? You know, like I don't, I don't, I don't want, I, that's not how I want to, you know, welcome Jesus back and how I want to meet him. And so it's a good moment for you right now to say, God, let this work in me goodness. Let it work in me a life that you want me to have. So you quietly talk to him about that. Wherever you are, wherever that lands in your circle, just pray for that. Take a moment to, just to ask for it um, and, and even just gaze towards it. You know, the whole Bible ends uh, with a description of all of these things and it ends in the book of Revelation. It says, you know, the spirit and the bride are just simply saying, even so, come. And maybe you should take a moment and, and just turn your heart towards that, saying, God, I want you to come. Uh, and I want to be ready for you to come, but I'm asking for it. So quietly, would you do that for a moment? I'll do the same. We'll close, and then we'll take a moment and close in prayer and worship in just a moment. But this is your moment. Quietly, take a moment to talk to God about what he's talked to you about.
Jesus, we think about you and your work, past, present, future. We thank you for what you have done, paying the whole price for our sin. We thank you for what you are doing, rescuing people in a harvest. We thank you for what you will do. You're going to gather us home. Well, there's an expectation that that's coming, maybe even soon. I think about what you told us here in this chapter, and I just pray for it right now. Would you rescue us from deception? Would you help us not to fall prey to the weird lies that permeate uh, our world and Christian circles? Would you give us a patient endurance that we could wait patiently until you come? Excited for it, but patient. Yet, Lord, give us that expectancy that is watching and looking up. Lord, we look at what's happening in our world right now and so many things just make me look and say, Lord, are we there? Is this when you're returning? I'm looking for it. I'm longing for it, yes, but I'm looking for it because, Lord, it just feels so close. Lord, I know it's going to happen. It happened quickly. But Lord, I pray that that belief would affect us. I pray for those who don't know you, that they are not worthy. They're not walking in the righteousness of Christ. They are just slated for destruction right now. And God, I'm, I'm praying for rescue. I'm praying for rescue from the wrath that is to come. I'm praying that you would help them to find just that, that, that you and find in the righteousness of Christ, they are made worthy. And they'd escape all that's about to fall in this world. God, I pray for those of us who that's going to happen. We're going to meet you in the clouds. We're going to uh, be with you forever. And yet that expectation should change how we're living now. Help it to do so. Uh, just cause even this to just do good in our souls right now. I ask for it for me and for all of the believers that are here right now. And we ask for it together in Jesus' name. Amen.